now because I always forget to do it before I actually start speaking um, and I'm going to hand over the mic to Robert so if everyone can mute themselves that'd be fantastic thank you over to me Alison is it yeah thanks very much thank you very much Alison great intro good stuff there. I'm just going to share my my screen and not host Alison can you allow me to share my screen I've just done it you've just done it sorry so go right let's just get rid of that let's put them down that's better let's do that and do you see that okay Alison yes thank you very much great well thank you everybody for tuning in um, as I say, tonight we're going to look at uh, the next half hour or so, we're going to look at creating a kind of social media campaign. Just a quick thing I wanted to say about the webinar, um, what it is and what it isn't. It's not going to be an in-depth exploration of every single social media application. We just don't have time to do that. And it's not really the purpose of this webinar. If so, there might be other webinars out there tell you how to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that kind of stuff. This is really about the campaign itself. It's about structuring a really good campaign. That's really the kind of purpose of this webinar. Um, and one other thing to say is that this webinar is also, this is also going to be presented in the form of a Charter for the Environment session. And I'll explain a little bit about that as I go along in the next sort of half hour or so. So I think the best thing to do is to dive right in. So sustaining social media toolkit creating campaigns. As I said, this is going to be a charter for the environment session. So people might, mightn't be totally aware that because we're using social media and we're using smartphones and tablets and computers, there isn't an environmental consequence. There actually is. There actually definitely is an environmental consent, consequence to that. That, 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 in, that, that involves how we grow, how we grow, how we grow our presence on social media, how we consume on social media, and how we use energy in the form of using carbon reduction on, on social media. But as I say, these little things will drop in every so often as I just sort of talk along here. So I shall get right into it now. Right. What, what, do, what do I mean by a social media campaign? Well, this presentation, it was really born out of, um, it was about a year ago when the whole lockdown thing started, I think it was last March, and I had just, over the, over the previous winter, had just filmed a couple of short films, and I had no way to show them, so I had to promote them online, I had to basically go online with doing them. So this webinar is really extracted out of real life experience, um, the good things, the bad things, the things that didn't work, and the things that, that, that kind of sort of surprised me and did work. But what I mean by a social media campaign, it's going to be a sort of planned, posted activity centered around an event to take place at a specific date and time. Now, this will most likely fall into three categories. It's going to be a film screening, an attended event, or an exhibition stroke display. Now, of course, that can be in person, a physical, a physical presence, or as we are at the moment, virtual online. There's other things I know that I know there are other things other than those three, but that tends to be what a kind of campaign centers around online. So, and for, for the purpose of this little chat here I'm doing, I'm using, I'm using a premiere that I did for a, a film that I did called Threads from the Deep about one of the world's foremost tapestry artists, Joan Baxter, who, as, as the strapline says in the top, I caught caught on camera at her home in the far north, north of Scotland. I did a, li a little short film about Joan and I premiered, it, or I premiered it online and it's about the promotion of that. So that's really what I mean by a social media campaign. So let's just start right at the beginning. The universal elements you're going to want to look out of a social media campaign, well, there's two kind of intrinsic things at the start and that's going to be what do you want to get out of the campaign? Now that might be different for different people, for different campaigns and different projects, but you'll know what it is that you want out of the campaign. And the second thing is gonna be the time factor, the time factor to do it, the time factor that you've got to do it and the time factor that the actual campaign will have and the event will have itself. So that, that's your two kind of universal kind of elements just to, just to kind of hang them on, nice two simple factors there. So what do you want out of the campaign? Let's explore the first one. 
Well, I think it's important to consider really what you're after. Um, but I think as I kind of go, again, a good hanging point here that will pretty much everybody's kind of looking for, you're going to be hanging on a kind of axis here of you've got an idea so that whatever that idea is for you, whatever that project is for you, whatever that cause is for you, you want to do some promotion around it and you want to get some growth upon it. You want to get some interest on that. And then you're going to want to use social media to do this kind of social media campaign, funnily enough. And that in itself is going to work around two key principles, and that's going to be interest and action. Now, the, this basically is the crux of this whole webinar. It's working, working the methods around gaining interest and then gaining an action on the interest, as it were. So the time factor. Well, I found out that I found a four week scenario was, was a good balance for a campaign. You can go longer, of course, you can go shorter. But I found four weeks was generally a good time frame to develop a good social media campaign. And this allows, as I just highlighted in the previous little sort of, um, page there, to, 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 for you to build upon two important areas of interaction. And if you remember what I said, it's the interest. And if you think of it in two halves, the first two week is what I call the intro. And that's all about generating interest. That's all you're going to do for the first two weeks is generate interest, generate interest, generate interest. And then you've got the campaign itself, the, the actual event itself, what it is that's going to happen itself. Then you've got the, the two week outro, and that's all about generating an action on the interest that you built. And that's all you do for that two weeks going out. So I, I hope that seems quite clear, a four week campaign timeline with a two week building interest, nothing, that's all you do for that two weeks, that's all you focus on is getting interest. And then you have the actual event itself, and then you spend the next two, one or two weeks or so building an action on the interest, because that's important. We don't want to waste all the interest, we want to build an action, a response to it. Okay. Narrative storytelling works best. Now, this is where this is where I think it's probably the most misunderstood element of what works well in a post and what works well in a campaign. And I'll come on in a minute what narrative is, but this is where I think we need to start thinking beyond standard post information. Now, if you look at the top left there, just up here, this is your standard stuff. You know, if you go on. The internet and it says what to do in that post well you know don't put too much tech don't don't have multiple links don't beg for likes or shares don't beg um too many posts in a day links to external links that visit external sites basically that means links that take you off the social media platform itself now these are all valid but to me there's something far 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 more fundamental and i've called that down here the hard truth now what I'm going to see here, it, it's not a personal thing, and it's 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 not a it's not an indictment upon anybody. It's something I learned, and what I found was the detail of what I had to see when I was trying to show the film. It was it was of great interest to me. It was of great interest to those around me, but the, the general truth was to everybody out there who's just flicking through their news feeds and their and their pages. It's not that big a deal, and I and I and there you go. Buster Keaton looks a bit affronted there. How dare you not be interested in my project? Well, the thing is, if we accept that, it's okay. How do we get people to be interested in it? Because that's what all the good campaigns do. They know that intrinsically, we're not that interested in anything beyond our general sphere. So how do, how do we get interest in, in what we're doing? And that comes in by, what I call here, this is where the good narrative comes into play. And narrative's really important. And there you go. Buster Keaton's looking a lot happier because we're now going to show, and he's going to help us show how narrative comes into play. By the way, the reason I've got a picture of Buster Keaton in there is because he is one of the best exponents ever to be in film that, that uses narrative. Remember, this is an age of silent cinema. He doesn't really use facial expressions that much, even though he does have a facial expression, but he is one of the best exponents at narrative storytelling. 
And that's what that's really, really what this webinar is about: narrative storytelling. Right. So narrative, it's a very kind of elusive kind of word. If I if you just flip into a dictionary, you go online, you get this thing here, a spoken or written account of, of connected events, a story. Well, it's fine, but it's not enough. And like, like Oliver Twist here, it, it's not going to nourish me, and I, and I don't think it nourishes you. We, we need a better explanation than this. So here we go. This is, this is a quote that I used from about oh, a year back when I had another presentation about I was delivering a film and, and looking at why certain films connect with us better than others. And what I found was, see, an effective narrative for me has always delivered a deeper message that's going to connect us with the plight of people, how we, how we treat each other, and this basically planet we all live on, we all share. And as such, I see narrative to be more akin to illuminating on basically the condition of being a human being. I'm wanting, I'm wanting the, the spark, I'm wanting the lightning to come down and hit my head and the hairs in the back of my neck to come. That's what I'm looking for when I mean narrative. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for that, that sort of thing that, 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 that resonates with me. It affects me. I'm looking for something to really affect me. And and there's Robert Burns there. And again, the reason I've used Robert Burns, he's another fantastic exponent at narrative communication. If you think of some of his, his, some of his poetry, some of his writing, Auld Lang Syne, it's sung. I, I mean, I've been lucky enough to go to a lot of places in the globe and it's recognized everywhere. And I mean, everywhere, everybody knows Auld Lang Syne. Why? Because it illuminates on the human condition. We're all the same. We're all in it together, unlike some other in it together campaigns out there. We're, we're, all, we're all in this globe as a human being together. But one of the best places to find narratives and one of the easiest to get a handle on it, and I want to spend a little bit of time to explore this, is in myths, legends, and folk tales. Okay, what exactly is narrative? Now, we've all heard of Little Red Riding Hood. I know you've all heard of it. But here's basically, again, from another presentation, here's three scenarios when Little Red Riding Hood appeared in, in, the, in popular and in folklore culture. The first was basically a thousand years ago in Italy. And it was a story told by the local peasants. But the, the narrative that was coming out of it at that time was this. It was werewolf trials led to religious superstitions by the populace. The narrative here was incredible religious superstitions. That's the narrative out of Little Red Riding Hood from that era. If we roll on a few centuries, we've got Little Red Riding Hood appear 17th, 19th century. And basically, this is the version that we all know today, really, really kind of made popular by the Brothers Grimm, and I think illustrated by, the, by Charles Perrault. And it was, this is the guys we know it today. But there's a different narrative was coming out of this version of Little Red Riding Hood. Here, it was, it was really was about young women avoiding the advances of young men in society. But at this point, popular society was quite a thing. And for well-to-do people, you didn't, want your, you didn't want your pretty young daughters going out meeting any old Tom, Dick and Harry. So a level of control was starting to come out. So the narrative had shifted here. It really had shifted. And now if, if I roll Little Red Riding Hood right up to date, late 20th century, it's basically by um, a, a writer called Angela Carter, who I've not read any of these, but apparently they're, they're very popular series of books. Um, so, so, um, and they're set in a fantasy country. And I, I think that one of the books is called Werewolf and a Company of Wolves. But the narrative has moved on again. And here, the narrative is to do with corrupting aspects of marriage, female identity, and power struggle within relationships. Now, the reason I'm showing this is not to highlight Little Red Riding Hood, but look how the narrative has evolved and changed and different aspects have come out of each era. But also look how the narrative, it's very, it's very across the globe. This, this is, some of this narrative would apply across the globe here. 
very, it's a very good narrative. It's very easy to get a hold of. And that's what we're trying to do with our campaigns. We're trying to extract a narrative from the story and from the detail. And that narrative, that's what's going to get people hooked into your, into your campaigns and your projects. So we're looking at about arranging some posts for platforms here. So basically, once you've kind of structured your campaign, once you've worked out your narratives, and you'll know, you'll know what they are for your particular project and campaigns and, and your thing, you'll, you, you'll know what the good narratives are. You're ready to target the social media platforms. And of course, this is going to be a mix of well-known applications. And some are going to form better than others. So it's going to be images, of course, clips, movies. We've got blogs, we've got GIFs, infographics, visual quotes. If you don't know what any of these are, then, then um, we don't have time just now, I'm afraid, to go into them. But, but do spend a little bit of time in your own time and just look them up and find out what they are and see if they're useful to you. But this is where we come on to one of our sort of charter for the, for the environment here. And I'm a great believer in um, organic growth when it comes to social media. And this is where it's going to be, it, it's, I found it's going to serve you so much better than trying to get thousands and thousands of likes and followers and hits and stuff like that. Okay, it's great. If you've got that, that's fine. But setting out just to get that, it's, it's going to be a bit misleading. And because you mightn't get the reaction you want. And you're far better to have, your, to have your growth on campaigns and social media grow organically. You're far better to grow. You're far better to get a few dozen people involved and, um, and have them really, really involved with your project than having, it, than having a couple of thousand that don't really care that much. So it's organic growth. That's what we're going for here. Okay. If, if you don't recognize this guy, he's, I'll show my vintage here. This is a guy called Max Headroom. And he's looking a little bit glum because what he's realizing is that there's, there's quite a lot of social media apps. But the point I want to make now is, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through these apps because like I said, this, that's not really the point of this webinar. It's more about the campaign. But be discerning. You don't need to use every single app. When I did the, the premiere for my film, I think I used two, just two. Uh, because I just thought, I just looked at the ages, at age groups, some demographic stuff, and I just thought that's going to serve me best. And also the time factor as well. So a couple of quick little things here about sort of some of these things. Well, Facebook, videos now are having a lot more engagement than all other content. So that's interesting to see that from, you know, from some of the stats, that it's 60% more engagement than all other content. Blog summaries are also very good. That's not pasting whole blogs, but little blog summaries, very, very good. Almost little micro stories. And a thing here which we call curated content is just a fancy way of saying sharing content from other pages. If you're struggling to, if you're struggling to sort of create some content, then put in some content on your site from other pages that's relevant. Twitter, of course, it's all about micro blogs with images and videos. But that's an interesting one about, about the user demographic, that 65% 65, 65 of users are between 35 and 65. Um, that's why I went for Facebook and Twitter, because I was aiming at a particular demographic as a, gen, as a generality. Of course, I was looking at younger people and much older, but as, as a generality for my campaign, that's what I aimed at. And YouTube is obviously video, but I even I was surprised to see this. It's the second largest search engine after Google, and that's because of people searching for video content. And I believe we've got another little chart of my a little chart of the environment here. And I think as we're talking about posting stuff here, I think we also need to be a little bit mindful about what others are consuming. And of course, that means what we consume as well. Because I mean, let's face it. The web and social media is just littered with content. I mean, if this was a street, it would be a it would be a mile high in litter. Every second or every microsecond of every day, it's just it's just propagated with 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 pretty much rubbish a lot of the time. So I believe like a well-balanced diet, and if I can mix my metaphors here a little bit, a well-balanced diet. Let's kind of consider what others consume online by being a little bit careful about what we post ourselves. We don't need to post all the time and use every single app out there. We can be a little bit discerning and choose where we're going to put stuff and what we're going to put out there. Um, some other ones we've got here, Instagram, 
tends to be sort of story reels, or short videos, visual quotes also do very well. Pin interest, which tends to be used a lot by retail, I believe. Um, infographics work quite well. Step-by-step -step guides, how to do stuff like that, tasks, and gifts around trends as memes. Now, if any of these expressions, you're not quite sure what they are, just, you know, just write them down and take a little check later on. I just don't have time to go into every single thing right now. And TikTok, which is it's quite a, it's, it's the big one. It's, it's, come out of the, it's come out of the teen area and it's now been used by a lot of campaigners now. So it's genres of dance, comedy, education. The, the demographic now has crept up. You've almost got a third who are 20 to 29 year olds. And it does drop off a little as you get a bit older, but it's interesting. The demographic was basically sort of, you know, teens, now it's moving up. So good platform if you're aiming at sort of young adults. And although Eventbrite strictly isn't social media, I think because of the pandemic and because of, because of the situation we're in, it has become an incredible platform for searching for events online because we can't go to stuff. So Eventbrite has become an incredible tool now. So it's traditionally event management ticketing system, but it's also become a, a powerful search base for events and looking for things, seeing what's, out, see, seeing what's out there, what other people are doing and what other people are getting interested in. And why, why we're on that as well, just to finish off what I was saying about just being a little bit mindful about what we're consuming. Um, I think campaigns, we've got, I, I, I want to differentiate. Making a social media campaign is different to your private posts, you know, like, like stuff you just do on your own pages. Um, over posting doesn't actually help you. I mean, I just want to make that quite clear. When you're doing campaigns, it's about a focused intent. It's not about, like I say, it's just sticking stuff all the time, multiple times a day. And actually the evidence is there now to see over posting does harm to what you're doing. So you're much better served by, by, a, by, by a good plan that's well-timed and spaced out, and you're giving your posts a chance for audience to digest them. So again, that's really going to help what people's going to consume, and, and you're going to consume as well using social media. So, oh yeah, energy consumption. This was a very interesting one I actually started looking into just a, a few weeks ago, and because I think because we're using we're using our phones and we're using sort of um, we're using um, tablets and even you know laptops. We don't think there's much of an energy factor going on, but there is the energy required to post online is pretty big, to believe it or not. Um, and lowering our energy use is obviously going to be good for our own bills. It's also going to be good for the environment, good for the planet. But just think for a second, the infrastructure behind what you're posting involves pretty big data centers, you've got internet routers, you've got hubs, but you've also got pretty large base stations, aerials, transmitters, all that stuff is making mobile internet accessible. And it is all using quite a vast amount of power. So let's just be mindful of the energy consumption that actually this stuff is using. And that, get, that just sort of highlights what I'm seeing in the previous couple of little slides here, that we don't need to post all the time in our campaigns. It, and, and actually at the same time, it's gonna help the whole carbon reduction thing big time. And while it's strictly not social media, I would say, please don't forget a press release. It is media, of course, but a press release is kind of the forgotten thing these days, but it can actually be very, very powerful. And the old journalist hack here is, if you've got a good human interest story, but that applies for everything. That applies to anything we're doing with our narrative. You're looking for that human interest story. Now, your press release is going to be good for these days. It's going to be better used for getting a local audience. But if you can really extract a great human interest story that's going to have a national sort of angle on it, you're going to get a, you are going to get a national appeal. So what I would do is craft different press releases for local and national audiences. I used them for great effect in them um, when I was showing my film and I got them into some local local rags or newspapers and I got them into, into a, couple of, a couple of big ones too. So they work very well for me. They might not be for you, but if, 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 you, know, if, you're, if you like writing and write sort of creative writing, then, then press, don't forget about you know, the old press release. It, it still has a lot to say. So 
just a little recap about some best practice stuff here. Um, we're looking at clear and interesting images and clips. We're looking for relatable content that's going to help increase audience engagement. That's important. It's got to be relatable. Clips that entertain, educate, or engage. Um, check image ratio for each of the social media apps. You'd think they'd be all the same, but they're not. Some of them have funny sort of, you know, ratios for their image size, length and height, so forth. So, so check those that you're not getting bits cut off when you post them. They've got, you know, you've got a oh, post it on there and that's cut off somebody's head. Um, consider creating some, maybe some content in a kind of niche style. If you know that there's a particular group, group of people out there that enjoy a particular style of content, maybe thinking about creating something that they like in that particular style. If you're going to use quotes, I'm sure you've seen lots of quotes in social media, you know, these little things, speech bubbles and so forth. Um, it's good if people can kind of relate to them, that, 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 that there is an understanding that, that we get the message quickly. And as we said here, a blend of, po a blend of posts across a few well-chosen apps is going to serve you well. But don't forget about traditional approaches too. And while we're at it in terms of the environmental side, Please, I would encourage you also, um, we don't need to produce files that are that excessively large because remember, it, you know, smartphones now and stuff, and, and even when it comes to taking video, they're taking some of these camera phones can take 4K video, you'll have you know, a high definition images. They're gonna be big images. And if you're just posting them on the internet, that's taking more power to display. So consider reducing the file size if you can. Um, if you're gonna post video, Consider posting in standard definition as opposed to high definition. Um, you just have your smartphone in your hand and watch a clip in high definition and after a minute or two, feel how hot your phone gets. That's the energy that's been used in the battery. And so think, so you're gonna have to charge your phone more often. You're gonna have to charge your phone more often. You're gonna have to draw off the grid more often. A lot of that is gonna be using carbon. So if you can, down, down export, down share your content into a manageable size and then, then share it. Um, keep, your clip, keep your clips quite short. Um, and the evidence there is, is also says that once you get into three, four minutes plus, the engagement really drops down dramatically. So, you know, one, two minutes for, for promotional clips is absolutely perfect. Um, Inform-led blog posts or inform-led any kind of um, information Let's be sure that if we're putting stuff out there, that there, you know, if, if there's research that can back it up or proper good science, or if, and, and of course, fundamentally, proper good wisdom and local knowledge, let's use that. Um, let's post data responsible content as well. And let's not just litter the net with stuff, basically. And also, I would say, including the actions towards the end of your campaign something that drives a change. I know the word sustainable. It's a bit, it's been used a lot, but, but I mean, if you think of it, your average Facebook post is, uh, it's got a shelf life of six hours. And I believe your average tweet on Twitter has a 20 minute shelf life. But I believe, I believe we can counter those. And, I, and I've done that uh, with the campaign I did for the film. I, I had just sharing two or three posts a week and I was, getting, I was getting engagement for two or three weeks with some of those posts. So we can counter some of that evidence. Let, 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 let's do sustainable posts, if, if, if that makes sense to you. So you're doing all the stuff. You're doing all the stuff I maybe said there. You think, great. What if you're still struggling for interaction? What if you're still not getting sort of uh, in the old fashioned days, it was fruitful through the door? What if you're not getting eye drops or eye, eye content on the screens? Well, there's a couple of little tactics you can use here. And one is, is using archival images. Now, this is a group up here called the Brora Salt Punch Research Group. Now, it's not the most snazzy group title in the world, and I know the folk there very well, but they have had an incredible, incredible success of using archival images of places, buildings, and people. It's a fantastic, fantastic uh, tool to increase your engagement. You might have old images of places and area everybody loves seeing. Oh, I remember visiting that shop. I remember when that used to be in so and so. That's knocked down. That's not there anymore. Look at that old car. My grandfather had one of those. It starts the debate, it starts the conversation. And as I said at the bottom, it becomes the lead in 
to, to then your main message. And that's a powerful, powerful tool. And I should also say as well, archival can also be on little mini blogs or little mini sort of articles. Here, they used a visit when Queen Victoria came up to the place. She, she actually went up to the, the it's, it's a small village in the Highlands of Scotland called Brora, and she did a local visit. Uh, they just did it as a bit of fun. So, so they did this thing here where she came up and they found an image and it got an incredible response. And then they were able to afterwards slowly bring in their message, which was about some of the ancient salt, uh, panning for salt on the shore, the industries there. So they used archival images as a lead in to get their message. It, I said, it's an unbelievable tool and it's very, very successful. And I would be, I would be amazed if you never got success using for archival images. There's another thing we can also do here, and that's connect to similar activities already happening in the world. Now, this topic that I had was about a tapestry artist. So what I did was I basically logged in to all the tapestry sites in a lot of the, a lot of the social media, and I shared the content there. And this is where I will say, if you're gonna connect to other sites in the world, please be sure it's relevant. And if you're unsure, do ask permission. Don't just drop stuff onto other people's pages willy-nilly. People can get a little bit miffed off if it's not relevant and you can get blocked or barred. And I know you wouldn't do that anyway, but please be sure it's relevant if you are going to connect and drop stuff into other people. But, you, but if you do, go for it, because I certainly did. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, about that in a second. But connecting to other activities, because believe me, you, you might think there's not, there's not many people doing what I'm doing. You'd be wrong. I found out there was tapestry sites all over the globe and some of them had thousands and thousands of followers. I, I, I was blown over. So when I shared my little film, they were delighted to have it. They were delighted to sort of take it on. And another thing is, which is slight, it's kind of related to the last one. It's cross theme to other events and conferences out there. And that's basically, that's basically your cross theming aspects of your core theme into other areas. Now, I'll explain a bit what I mean by that. So the core theme of the film I was, was it, it, the film in my campaign was tapestry art. That, that was the core theme. But out of that, I extracted three other themes. So I cross themed into folklore because the person that makes these tapestries she puts lots of folklore. There's lots of stories told through the tapestry, like, like the one, I don't know if you can make it out, but it's basically, that's the story of the selkie behind the, the back of the woman's head. So her tapestries have folklore in them. So I connected with all the folklore people on the internet. I, so I cross theme to them. I also cross theme to storytelling because many of her tapestries tell stories. So I found lots of storytelling um, places on different social, I cross, I cross theme to there. And I cross theme to lots of museums and heritage groups and places like that, because I discovered, believe it or not, that they all, all these museums and heritage and local little cultural groups, they've all got subgroups. There was incredible, they've all got their, they've all got their weavers groups and their local craft groups, and they were all interested in it. So I cross themed my core theme into three other areas. But again, I would say, think about it, make sure it's well thought out and make sure if you're going to connect that it, 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 it really does have a relevant theme. It really does. There is something there. And remember, you might need to extract a little different story. So when you're, when you're, when you're cross theming, you're just got a little lead in. So you might start off, instead of starting off with tapestry, I started off with folklore. Then I brought in the, weave, the tapestry. Here, I started off telling some of the stories about her tapestry, then I, I brought it into the film and so on. So that's a nice little tactic you could try. Okay, paying for boost. Now you may have heard of this or you possibly have, have done this already. Now, this is where you pay a little extra money on certain platforms and you get a little bit of what we call a, 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 a paid promotional boost of your post. But what we don't want, we don't want, like the kids here, we don't want you throwing good money after bad. That's what we, we certainly don't want that. And it's very easy to get carried away and do it. Uh, I believe you don't actually need to spend that much at all. Now, some of the big organizations, they'll spend 
hundreds of thousands of course you're they're trying to get they're trying to get everything the planet to follow them so but at the with a little bit of thought here a little paid boost can be a good idea of course you don't have to do this but i i engaged it and what i found was at the start of week one and at the start of week two in the build up to your planned activity i found that was a good beginning so what i did was i spent 10 pound in week one and i spent 10 pound in week two on on on, on one post each and i gave it a boost and the boost covered two to four days less than that wasn't effective and i found more than that was too general but i found 10 pound was enough i didn't want to spend any more i didn't have unlike the kid here i didn't have bundles of bundles of dollars or notes flying out i didn't have a lot of money to spend in this so i did that a little word of warning here i learned this a hard way and a lot of folk i'd have with when you get onto the, the area that talks about the boost, forget the general boost that promise a reach of hundreds and hundreds of thousands. It's pretty much, yes, they can target those, but that's not who's going to be interested in your campaign or your post. Instead, target those that like your page and their friends. And you do what I call onion layer. You build it up. And this is where organic growth is important. Now, initially, you mightn't get that many, but you're going to get ones that's far more accurate and, and far more likely to be involved. And it can take a little bit of time to develop, but I would say forget about just general boosts that promise hundreds of thousands of, of you know, people logging onto your page and so forth. Doesn't work. So that's what I found. Right. Yeah. Right. Time. Okay, we're getting on here. Right. Don't worry about this. We're going to break this down very quickly. That's why Mark's head was looking a little bit glum. He's thinking, this is my campaign broken down here. Very quickly, I'm, I'm going to go through it. I'm going to go through this. Okay, week one. I don't know if you remember, I spent, I said week one and week two, generating interest, generating interest. And I'm just going to zip through this very quickly. Don't worry, you don't have to make notes of this. This is just what I did. So I put a film poster post on Facebook. I put a, a Facebook event post linked to Eventbrite. I paid a boost to, event, to the Facebook event. I shared. I infiltrated and cross-referenced. Remember all those sites I talked about sharing and cross-referencing? Look at the number I connect, 107 groups. That was the most work, 107 places. I shared and I found and I did it. It's hard work. Campaigns are hard work. I film post I tweeted on Twitter. Facebook event was tweeted on Twitter, not Eventbrite. I wanted to drive my, tra my, my traffic through Facebook. Um, and I tweets were tagged to various interest parties. And an event was created in the event right with tags. If you don't know what any of this stuff means, make a quick note, write it down, and look it up afterwards. And I created some hashtags. That was just week one. Week two, um, I had the film live premiere file. So I had my film live in Facebook. So I had the file on there. I was post dated. I gave that a boost as well. I gave that a boost. I shared, infiltrated, and I cross referenced again to interest parties there. This time it was 30. I, I, I worked on a different group there. I had a film premiere tweet on Twitter. I tweeted again, interest parties, and I added all the hashtags to those tweets. So week one, week two, I was just generating interest, just generating interest. And I focused here, I was concentrating on Facebook and Twitter. That's all I used. I didn't use any of the other ones. For you, it might be different. You can use other ones. And for different films in the future, I might use other ones, but that's all I did for this one. Then I had the event itself. Then my focus shifted. I, I moved from gener generating interest to generating action. I wanted an action from all the people that took an interest. So I did a thank you post to all that attended. I sent a thank you email to all those that registered in the event, right? I put a thank you statement by the film subject that was the tapestry artist or helps the, the tapestry artist herself. I got her to, to do a, a, a private thank you. I put a, a, a question post out. Did you enjoy the film? I put another question post. Would you like to see more films like this? I put coming soon to see more films like this. And I followed up with some, some related posts about, um, I, I kept the theme going. I found some other stuff to do with tapestry. I'm not a tapestry person, I'm a filmmaker, but I kept the vibe going. I offered free registration to the next event. If you follow, the film is on, is, is on the lower project uh, YouTube page. I give them a, I give them free registration. I did subsequent watch parties, which are, if you don't know what watch parties, please look it up. It just means you can watch the film again at a later date. I launched a new YouTube channel and I promoted that to them. And I basically, I used the action to springboard the next campaign. 
That's what I did. Now I blasted through that. I know that was very, very quick and very naughty of me. So my final thought here, don't worry about such, such, some of that fast stuff I just did there. The power of what you have to say, people, is in the way that you connect with other people. And in social media apps themselves as tools, they're basically worthless without that voice. So if you can explore ways in which you can get people to think and wonder and anew at your themes, you have not only connected your message, you've done something much more important. You have eliminated on, as Carl Sagan, the climatologist says, this pale blue dot we call home. Now, that's what I want you to take away from here, people, is don't get hung up on all the technicalities of all the different social media. That. Think your story and then think your narrative of the story. That's what I want you to go away with. I have a very, very quick little clip to show you, and that is a little bit from the film that I premiered. Now, Zoom can put the stream a little bit juddery. So if this clip doesn't look that great, don't worry, it's not you, it's not me, it's just how the stream goes. But thank you so much. I will do my best to answer questions at the very end. But just, just again, please know, I, I can't really get into social media apps in a kind of in-depth way. It would just take too long and it would spoil other people's questions. So thanks again. I shall leave you with this little clip of Threads from the Deep and I'll do my best to do your questions after. Some of my pieces I have left the warts, which are the sort of vertical part of a structure. And they're also the skeleton, even though you cover them up. But quite often in my work, I leave them exposed in places just to say, right, I'm a textile here. Um, a lot of it, I'm a great believer in the subconscious as well. So, so a lot of these decisions are just made as I go along. People sometimes say, well, it looks just like a painting. I don't want people to say that. Um, I want people to see it. it's a textile. I don't want them to dwell on the fact that the technique or anything like that, that's kind of unimportant. Since what Penelope was doing, she was waiting for Adam Oman to come back from the wars. Except she wore it during the day and undid it at night. Okay, thank you, Alison. Brilliant, and thank you, Robert. Right, so we're on to the question and answer bit now. So I've got, I think, let me see, just one at the moment, I think, in the chat. Oh, why, why aren't I seeing it? Let me see. Right, yes. Okay. If anyone want, wants to add, add, ask a question, please just put it in the chat with that asterisk so I can I can see that it's not just chat, it's actually a question. So from Katrina, um, do you want to say your question? From Huntley Witham and Rhyme? You just unmute by clicking at the bottom of the screen usually, or up at the top, right. Do you want me to say, oh, wait, wait, sorry. I know what the mystery is. It's not you, it's me. Um, I will allow you to unmute yourself. There, try it now. That's it, sorry. No, that's okay. I was just wondering, so I run my own business, so it's a bit different, but um, you've talked about sharing on existing Facebook groups, for example. 
quite often feel when I try to write something that it feels like obvious PR and you know might come across as pushy um, so besides the sort of cross-referencing as you said and trying to engage with things they're interested in how do you have any tips on this and how to make sure that it doesn't come across as really businessy or um, um well I think I mean I mean just be yourself. Just say I've got this. I, I don't know what the project is or the campaign is, but just say I've got this project. If it's, this is what I say, if it's something that's really relevant to them, they'll be interested or they should be interested. So don't worry about it. Just, just say, or if you're worried, don't post, just send a private message first, you know. So yeah. I would send up, if, if you're a bit concerned, send a private message. I mean, everybody, well, they'll be delighted to get a message. Say, yeah, somebody thought to me, this would be good. This might, I did that for a lot of the things. I sent a private message first. I said, I don't know these people. I'm just, I'm private. This might be interesting to, you, to, to your, your members. Check this out. If it did, they posted it. And, and, and if they don't, don't worry about it. Move on to the next one. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. No, that does help. Go for it. Just go for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> good advice. It's always good advice to that. Yeah. Okay, so um, I think it's Heidi now. Oh no, Irma, and then Heidi, sorry, Irma, and then Heidi. <laughs> Hello, Thank Heidi. you, thank you, Roberta. It was really interesting. I was just wondering, you mentioned in one of the last slides that you said, well, the, the week four you kind of used as a, also to generate, in, to have this interest that is generated for the next campaign, like to so as a springboard for you. Yes, yes, that's right. And yeah. I wondered, um, whether you're just going to kind of run from campaign to campaign of, or whether you also build up following. So maybe this is also related to Susan's question on like longer, like longer uh, engagement. Um, is that created out of the campaign as well? Well, well, I don't, I don't do social media all the time. I mean, I, I make a differentiation. I use it as a tool. Now, I, I use it as a tool. I go on to it. I get what I need to do and I get off it. It's a two. So between between the films I did, between that film and the next film, there was months. There was a, a couple of months. So it wasn't like I had the next thing the next week or the next month. It wasn't like that at all. I just, just this is where this is where I think people feel with social media. I've got to be up, up, up all the time. I can't let it even go down. It's crazy. You, you can't do that. I mean, you, you're going to drive yourself like not you know you're going to lose them you're going to lose the marbles you know basically because you've got to let it go down you've got to let things subside then you, then you take it up again and that's what i'm saying that's what good campaigning does you can't just bounce up go from one bounce bounce like a you know, the skimming stone across the water um so i had a great gap between the that film and the next film so i let it go down but i just preempted them and and ask them like the page follow and then when i'm ready i just come in with the next one a good few weeks or a couple of months later. I certainly don't keep going every kind of few weeks like that. I mean, it does depend for different organisations. We, we do post yeah. up like a lot um, yeah. to keep to keep the readership up, but that's because we want, it's a different way of doing it. If you're using it as a targeted campaign for certain events, yeah. that's quite diff different from building up your readership. Um, so it can, it's for different things, but as Robert was saying, it's about action, generating the action. So it depends on what action you want to generate yes. as well. Yeah. Um, and if you want to push people into liking your page for the next time or, or whatever. Yeah. Anyway, I, um, yeah, sorry. No, I was just saying, I, I, maybe clarify. The campaign I'm talking about, it isn't something that you have every kind of few days or every week. It's maybe for something a little bit more special is the wrong word, but it's something a little bit more important that you might be doing, not that, often really you know something that you really want to build up to something like that i know i do things where well. you want to every few weeks you're building up to something else and that would be a sort of lower level campaign if you know what i mean you know yeah brilliant okay heidi over to you hi Hello. Hello. i'm a social and environmental justice advocate from uh, the southern maine and wabanaki territory area fantastic i'm wondering about uh the how you've gotten around the whole facebook jail thing you know about that can you explain that to people Not really. or do I need to... um is it, is it something we can discuss here <laughs> yeah facebook jail is when you're told that you don't you can't post anymore because yeah. you've posted into too many groups especially when you're doing things if you're sharing out facebook live streams 
Yeah. And I find that it's hard to get a lot of action on a lot of my my different posts. So I end up having to tag people yeah. to get more people into in to engage with my posts and the ones that are most important to bring awareness to that. Okay, I'll put my hand up. I'll put my hand up. Okay. I've had experience of that. I've been a bit naughty as well a long time ago, over posting, trying to share stuff out. You learn the hard way. What I did was send a direct message more often. Message them. It's it's more work. It means you got to sit and you got to open messenger, but it's more it's more personal. You're far more likely to get in, you're far more likely to get a response than just you know sharing, 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 and then I'm in jail because I've shared three thousand times in the past hour. <laughs> send it. You send a direct message if if you can get you know send, send more direct messages. That that that's what I found. And well, the hit is far higher. I, I've also found that if I share with more than like 15 people or 20 people at their third, maybe it's more like 30 to 40 or something people yeah. at a time that within mm -hmm. Messenger that they can tell you that you can't use Messenger for several hours on end. So it's really yeah. tricky. Well, maybe you need to get a few other oh. folk involved and maybe get them to, to share some of the burden as well. And that will save right. one, one. That's one. what I'm thinking. Yeah. Yeah. You know, maybe we need to think about creating teams to help people mm -hmm. to share things yeah. out for people. Abso absolutely. It sounds like it's, it's too much for one person. I agree with you. Yeah, right. I think that you can also stagger it, of course, as well. But can we move on to the next person? Because we yeah. haven't got much time. Yeah. We've got a question from Susan. Susan? Hello, Susan. Can't hear you, poor shame. She's still muted, I think. You're still muted, Susan. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I was wondering, you. Uh, part of what you said already maybe answered my question when you yeah. talk about you have different campaigns that you allow it to subside and then it comes up again. Um, I'm thinking about uh, they're trying to keep a much longer campaign going that could be two years, three years, indeterminate length, just yeah. trying to keep people interested yeah. so that they don't forget about it. Well, what I would say, Susan, if you can imagine a wave pattern and yeah. the crests in the trough, so think of your two year campaign as a series of little minier ones mm -hmm. and then let them go up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. You can't keep up, you can't keep a high line for two years. It's just impossible. Well, so, what we found there are sometimes things, external things happen that will kick something off. So yeah. you get a flurry of activity and then it kind of goes yeah. quiet. Yeah, I would definitely break it down so so, so it's, you've got your one two year and then and then see them as a smaller time frame and then, and then even that could be a smaller time frame. Yeah, so you have sort of little campaigns within a campaign. Absolutely, oh, yeah. Thanks. No problem, Susan. Okay, we've got two more questions and we'll have to finish there because we're already going over. So I've got a question from Zaria. Zaria, do you want to ask this question? Yeah, thank you. Um, very, very interesting presentation. Thank you very much. And I'm coming from Climate Action Lewisham in London, so a long way away from you guys. <laughs> but, yeah, um, we're interested, obviously, in local behaviour change, and we're trying to use social media to make people really think about stuff to the extent that they change what they do. For example, go vegan is one thing we did yeah. recently. Now, this is a bigger ask than clicking on a, you know, a presence at a film. Oops. Or, or booking an event. Obviously, it's a much deeper change. I really like all the ideas around narrative and how you control narrative. I think that is, you know, you highlighted how key that is. But I'm wondering if you have any further thoughts about whether that's possible or desirable. Have you ever heard it work? Do you think I should do it or just use Facebook for more superficial things? I'm not I, sure. Well, do you remember the little thing where I had the little red riding hood? Do you remember yeah. that? Yeah, remember the narrative that's coming out there because it's pretty gruesome themes coming out of there sometimes. And sometimes when you've got quite a subject that's pretty, you know, to, to, to other people might be a bit raw, a little bit sensitive. We've got to find another narrative, another way, another, another lead in, another way in, and then you get your message. And that's why I think these things are important because um, if you've got, so you want to change, change a mindset and change a behavior, that doesn't work. It doesn't work. You know that I've tried that. Why didn't it? It doesn't work. It doesn't forget mm. it. it. Doesn't work. So we use other ways, other narratives. So explore 
story, narrative, mythology. Don't forget mythology is important. Mythology is a great thing to get people. I don't mean mythology in little, you know, wolves and stuff, but the mythology of our lives, the way we live, very, it's very key. But narrative is important. If, you, if, if, if I can give you one thing to take away, explore the story and the narrative and the stuff behind you, your, your message, you know, be, the stuff behind your message, get that out front. I guess with like going vegan, you can you can spotlight um, some famous people have done it and also the kind of the health, you know, the kind of yeah. daily meat intake, etc. There's lots of different ways of doing it in a kind of a roundabout route. And I guess that's what you were saying, Robert, wasn't it? Yeah. Anyway, we're going on to Akil now. Akil? Hi, hi Robert. It was it was Ooh. fascinating to kind of hear about your your points around mindful posting and organic growth. Um, and yeah. just the, I guess the question was around kind of the social media platforms, like I guess in today's age, they can encourage a kind of clickbait culture and lots of scrolling and those sorts of things. So in, in your mind, how can we best utilize them whilst not also playing into that kind of, that kind of narrative? Well, the thing is, as soon as you start to do the thing that's there, you've kind of, it's part of it, but you'll be quickly at the bottom. You know what I mean? As soon as you start to do something that everybody else is doing, but everybody else is doing it sort of almost, not better, but there's, you know, you've got companies and organizations and they're specialists at this. Are you with me? They're specialists at clickbait and getting you into it. Do it a different way. And that different way, you can, you can get interest in stuff as well. It doesn't always have to be the way that, that that's something you see out there. You don't always have to just do it the, the way that that's maybe the obvious way is out there, you know. Okay, thanks a lot. That's okay. Great, and um, we've got, and if you want to look um, at Akil's post on the chat, he's talking about other ethical platforms that people could maybe look at. Um, and last question is from George. George? George. Hi, George. Hi. Hi, uh, Robert. Yeah, you touched on it, but maybe go a bit further. Well, one of the big problems I think we have in, in what we're trying to do is the danger of speaking to ourselves and those who are already engaged. And if you're running a campaign where you want to reach out to people who aren't necessarily terribly interested or are marginally interested, the, get, the ability to create a headline based on the narrative to excite people is very, very important. And yeah. I wonder if you had any suggestions about how to sort of uh, engage the interest of those who normally wouldn't be terribly interested in what you're doing. Um, the, the, the good thing with narrative is that a good narrative, do you remember I had the slide up about the press release? Yeah. The press release. Now the old journalist hack statement was, if you know, years and years ago, if the journalist came along and they said, we're looking for a human, human interest story. Now if, if you see there's no black and white film, human interest. Now, I know the words kind of lose meaning. Think of that every time. What have I got here that's gonna, that's gonna interest human beings across the planet? What have I got here that's got an interest? Can I, can I come up with a few words on, on, on what I'm doing here that's got an interest to human beings on this planet? A human interest story. Yeah. Yeah. That's what yeah, I would do. Very, yeah. Thanks, Robert. Uh, I would just like to say a big thank you to, to Alison and her team, Aberdeen, Aberdeen Climate Action, for helping me with this today. They've done an immense power of work. So thank you, Alison. My pleasure, Robert. And we're just excited that Climate Week's coming up so soon. And we'll be doing using all of these things <laughs> to, yeah, to cool. push Climate Week Northeast, which is mostly and pretty much will be all online. So anybody from around the world, can come along to the event. So check us out, um, hashtag CWNE21 um, on Eventbrite, on Facebook, on our website. And um, that's Climate Week Northeast, the 12th, 21st of uh, March. And we look forward to seeing you, a lot of you at the, at, at the events then. And thank you, Robert, for a great time. Thank and you. thank you all of you for coming and sharing in this. And hopefully we'll all have very successful social media campaigns to get yeah. people to do more on the climate. Yeah. Great. Thank you. All best. Goodbye. Bye-bye.